Hi, I am Faye Ellington. In 1995, I conducted a radio interview with retired former Prime Minister of Jamaica, Michael Manley. My interview was recorded at Mr. Manley's home in Jamaica and was broadcast on his birthday, December 10, 1995. Over the past 28 years, since the program had its first and only airing on the now defunct Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation, JBC, I have thought, why do I keep this interview sequestered in my home library? And now I have decided to release the interview on my YouTube channel. This will be in seven parts over seven days, beginning on Sunday, September 10, with the seventh and final part scheduled to be published on the anniversary of my 49th year in broadcast media, Saturday, September 16. At points during the interview, you'll hear the voice of Mr. Manley's wife, Glynn, and that of program musician, Marjorie Wiley. Broadcast engineer 28 years ago was Peter Brown. It is my hope that this interview will provide new information and insights, generate discussion, and I know there's going to be a whole heap of debate and perhaps trigger ideas for further research and investigation. I'd like to thank the Gleaner Archives, Mrs. Glynn Manley, Sarah Manley, his daughter, and Granville Valentine for making pictures available. Thank you for listening. Please share and comment. When you hear the name Michael Manley, what single word comes to mind? Controversial? Charismatic? Well, it is my intention to expose the man, the person behind the politician, the trade unionist, the lecturer, the author, the international statesman, the petulant schoolboy. That's Michael Manley, our guest. My guest is allowing us to share in his birthday anniversary celebrations and... Uh, Today's your birthday. Happy, happy birthday. It's a wonderful Sunday, and thanks for having uh, afforded us the opportunity to spend it with you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> There's so many levels to Michael Manley. Uh, the majority of people know him as a politician. There are so many other people who remember him as a trade unionist, and those of us at the JBC, perhaps some of us were a little too young to have been there when you did some really interesting things in South Odeon Avenue. But I want to start at the very beginning. What are your earliest memories of your childhood? <laughs> oh, that, that your earliest your memories, you know, your it, mother, it really your father. Like I was Brand Lara, clean board first. <laughs> That was not the intention. <laughs> no, where, no, no. For instance, where, where did you um, grow um, up? What are my earliest? But if, literally, they aren't very interesting, you know. But I, but I can tell you what they are. Um, we had a, a huge mastiff dog called Bigums, who weighed 190 pounds. And my earliest memories are about this big, impressive, seemingly overpowering dog, who in fact was very affectionate and very fond of children and seemed for some obscure reason to be very fond of me. And he was one of my earliest friends. <laughs> what can I tell you? I, I remember that. I, I have very early memories of chips, wood chips, in an art studio of my mother, you know, working in her wood period, so to speak, when she always carved. And that is a very early memory, and watching the chips grow. And uh, slowly as you got older, beginning to get a sense of what you thought she was doing, you know, with different sculpture. That's an early memory. What um, about an early memory of your father? Yes, that's now a totally different scene. <laughs> My first memory of him is in the ring, the boxing ring that he built at, in the backyard. And the first thing I remember him as quite a fine, aggressive boxer, who often would box with some of the people that he was encouraging to be boxers. So you see, it's a rather, it's a sort of odd, odd range of things that, that I remember. What about your brother, Douglas? What kind of relationship you had with him as a young boy? Always, um, well, firstly, I think we were always, you know, friendly, which is not necessarily always the case with brothers. One of my strongest early member memories of him is of him being a quite brilliant young athlete at the Cartwright School. I remember once literally bursting with pride when I went to the Cartwright to watch him win, rather like his dad used to, 
in championships, win every event, hurdles, high jump, long jump. And eventually, you know, he beat Herb McKenzie in the famous 100 yards yeah. at Sabina Park. He beat Herb. Douglas Manley beat, beat Herb McKinley? He beat him and beat him quite soundly in the 100, <laughs> as Herb will tell you. <laughs> when, when he ran this 10 flat and equaled his father's record set, oh, what was it, 30 years before. Was he your mentor, your brother? Um, I greatly admired him. He was, um, he was very scholarly. He still is read a lot and so he I greatly admired that when he was at Col um, Columbia University it was a great thrill to come down from the Canadian Air Force and you got a weekend furlough as they called it and I'd go down to spend it in New York with him and we used to have marvelous time you know for instance I, we saw Paul Robeson play Othello on one of those trips one of the greatest experiences of all my life Robeson on the stage. I met him later and found him this incredibly warm, big man. He's the ultimate, he's the biggest man I ever met in my life, Paul <laughs> Robeson. That don't mean it's size, quality of his mind, something about his generosity of spirit. Extraordinary man. But we saw him play Othello in what is still regarded as one of the definitive exp experiences of Broadway theater. Jose Ferrer the great Puerto Rican played Iago. It was unbelievable to watch the two. You know, I'm listening to your talk and you have taken them into the arts and I was saving that for later on, but I think I need to bring you back to the influences that your mother and father had on you, generally speaking, as a young man, young child rather, before you get into the adolescent years or before you became a young man. Was it primarily with the arts? In the earliest sense, I will, I think two things really. The arts definitely, because not only was mother an artist, obviously, but they both loved music. So there was always, you know, from as early as I can remember, classical music was just a part of what would happen every evening of life almost. It was like breathing. And they were both tremendously widely read, fascinated, by the novel. I mean, I was reading Dostoevsky at 15 on the recommendation of my mother sort of thing and totally engrossed in this whole study of human psychology and all that. And uh, you could just trace it through everything. They were hugely interested in everything. And I was extremely lucky to grow up in an atmosphere where curiosity was as natural as breathing. You went to St. Andrew's Prep School? I, I launched it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were one of the I, first students. I was, I was one of about ten pioneers. <laughs> Where was yeah. it then, in those years? Same place. Is that so? Yeah. Teacher called Miss Sonia Anderson. And you know, there was a, a, this suddenly flashes back. The first, in fact, the only fight I ever got into in my life, because I abhor physical violence. I have no part of that. But I was about seven. And this boy <laughs> kept going round and round me saying, Norman Washington Manley. <laughs> and to me, this was the ultimate insult to call my father Washington. You know, he's just a kid. And I beat him up. <laughs> you beat him up? <laughs> I mean, did you roll First on the ground and all that? the last time I ever got into any fight with anybody. Yeah, but I was not about to have my father called Washington. <laughs> You're about seven then. I was about seven. Yeah. Well, you know, rumor has it that you have a terrible temper. Is that true? Ask Glenn. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's true. I mean, it is, it is so moment. rumored. Let me bring her on in here. Hi, Mrs. Manley. Hi. Rumor has it that your husband has a terrible <laughs> temper. Is it true? In all honesty, it was very, very bad. But I don't <laughs> think it was half as bad as his father's. But um, I think recently he's, he's not he's, he's a lot calmer now than he was and he, he's not suffering the pressures that caused the temper tantrums but yes in fairness and in honesty he had a terrible temper how did persons who came in contact with a temper deal with it women would probably cry men would either sulk or go outside and kick a bucket or something like that but i don't think too many people showed their displeasure at his temper tantrums directly to his face because that would only make things worse.
I, you know, I think in fairness, I think you'd concede I, I get out of a temper as quickly as I get into it, and I forget it, and never carry grudges. You don't hold malice? Not never. about, never in my life, about anybody or anything. I don't carry malice, I don't hold grudges. I explode, move on, and forget it. Do you feel as if you've cleansed yourself once you've exploded and got it out of your system? I don't know if it's even that conscious. You are describing what happens as distinct from my saying, I feel I have. That yes. is a different thing. The fact is, it has happened. I think if one had to say, I feel I should, or I feel I have, it then becomes a conscious process, which is not real. With me, I just genuinely, you see, I, I generally don't lose, lose my temper about nothing, you know. From as a kid, I have a highly developed sense of fair play and justice. And if something happens that I feel is not just, is not right, is not true, I am explosive about it, I am indignant about it. And I, you know, I explode about it. And then when it's finished, I forget about it. Thank you for listening to part one of my Michael Manley interview. Well, it's going to be in seven parts. I'll release one part each day. Coming up tomorrow, we'll talk about the Jamaica College years. He said he was badly bullied there. Oh, Lord. And um, he had a run-in with a new headmaster, you know. And see here, you'll hear what nearly happened between him and the headmaster and how his Jamaica college years ended. Was he an athlete like his dad? What do you think? But is that where his quest for justice began at Jamaica College? Well, make sure you listen to part two. This is Faye Ellington thanking you for listening to my Michael Manley interview recorded 28 years ago.